Hi everyone, welcome to Barter Hordes. My name is Robert and this is our first episode in a new series called Exploring Stories. The plan is to do one story each week for an extended period of time until I run out of ideas or the story series doesn't catch on or any number of reasons could end the series whenever it ends. But my plan is to do up to 100 stories. So a couple of years could see this project through if it, if it works out well. Today's story is a very short one. It's called A Day's Wait by Ernest Hemingway, and it was written in 1933. So let's get right into it. Ernest Hemingway grew up in a suburb of Chicago, spending summers with his family in rural Michigan. After high school, he got a job writing for the Kansas City Star, but he left after only six months so he could join the Red Cross Ambulance Corps during World War I, where he was injured and awarded the Silver Medal of Military Valor. Afterward, he lived in Ontario and Chicago, where he met his first wife, Hadley Richardson. In 1921, they moved to Paris, where he worked on his writing and also developed a long friendship with F. Scott Fitzgerald and other American writers of the lost generation. After the 1926 publication of his first novel, The Sun Also Rises, Hemingway divorced Hadley and married Arkansas native Pauline Pfeiffer. The couple moved to Florida, where Hemingway wrote A Farewell to Arms, 1929, which became a bestseller. Hemingway then moved to Spain to serve as a war correspondent in the Spanish Civil War, a job that inspired his famous 1939 novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls. After its publication, Hemingway met his third wife, Martha Gellhorn. Hemingway married his fourth and final wife, Mary Hemingway, in 1946, and the couple spent the next 14 years living in Cuba. In 1953, Hemingway won the Pulitzer Prize in fiction for his novel, The Old Man and the Sea, and in 1954, he won the Nobel Prize in literature. After a final move to Idaho, Hemingway took his own life in 1961, following in the footsteps of his father, who had died by suicide in 1928. Many of Hemingway's works examine father-son relationships including the essential Hemingway short story, Indian Camp, along with numerous other stories featuring his recurring protagonist, Nick Adams. Some scholars have speculated that Nick, a child and young man in Hemingway's earlier story collections, is now the adult father of Shots in a Day's Wait. The book that the father reads to his son in the story, Howard Pyle's Book of Pirates, is a real collection of pirate stories and illustrations by Howard Pyle, published in 1921. Pyle wrote and illustrated a number of books for children, most famously The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood, 1883. Hemingway's interest in writing about death and the failure of conventional values like masculine heroism was shared with other members of the Lost Generation, a group of writers who came of age during World War I and were deeply affected by their exposure to the horrors of warfare. After World War I, many such American and British writers formed a community in Paris and created lasting intellectual and personal bonds. Other notable writers who belong to the Lost Generation include F. Scott Fitzgerald, the Great Gatsby, The Beautiful and the Damned, and James Joyce, a portrait of the artist as a young man, and Ulysses. Hemingway's three children, all boys, were born between 1923 and 1931. In the winter of 1932, the oldest boy, nine-year-old John, came down with influenza. The episode likely inspired this story, which his father wrote a few months later. Most scholars believe that the unnamed narrator in A Day's Wait is in fact Hemingway's returning character, Nick Adams. In another story featuring Nick and his son, the boy is also called Shots. Hemingway used the same term of endearment for his own sons. 
The unnamed narrator, the father of a nine-year-old boy nicknamed Schatz, notices one morning that his son is shivering, pale, and in pain. He asks the boy what's wrong, and his son responds that he has a headache. The father twice tells him to go back to bed, but the boy refuses, instead getting dressed and going downstairs. When the father comes down and sees his son sitting by the fire, looking ill, he feels the boy's forehead. He can immediately tell that the boy has a fever, and he sends him up to bed. The boy obeys his father, but he still insists that he's fine. The boy is clearly sick, but he's determined not to be incapacitated by his illness. He wants to dress and go downstairs like his father, not lie meekly in bed and be coddled, perhaps an effort to seem more mature. In vain, the loving and protective father wants his son to stay safely tucked away in his bed. The doctor comes to examine the boy. He takes the boy's temperature and says that he has a fever of 102 degrees. Downstairs, the doctor leaves medicine with the father and diagnoses the boy with mild influenza. The doctor says that it isn't dangerous as long as the boy's fever stays below 104 and doesn't turn into pneumonia. The doctor examines the boy and announces his temperature, but he leaves the room without explaining his diagnosis to the boy, a significant lack of communication that catalyzes the boy's anxiety. Downstairs, the doctor and the father discuss the condition and recommend treatment in the patient's absence, not thinking it necessary to include him in adult matters. Back upstairs, the father offers to read aloud to his son from a book called Howard Pyle's Book of Pirates. He notes that the boy's face was very white and that he seemed very detached from what was going on. The boy can't follow what his father's reading, but he won't go back to sleep either. Eventually, he tells his father that he doesn't have to stay in the room if it bothers you. His father denies this, but the boy only repeats himself. No, I mean you don't have to stay if it's going to bother you. Reasoning that his son must be feeling a bit lightheaded, the father gives him more medicine and leaves him alone to rest. The book that the father chooses to read to his son, Howard Pyle's Book of Pirates, chronicles the adventures of infamous pirates. Pirates promote ideal masculinity as fearlessness and toughness, not humility and thoughtfulness. This model of manhood and heroism prompts the boy to conceal his fear of dying and suffer in silence rather than accept comfort or seek clarification about his illness. The boy's belief that he needs to prove himself a man by shouldering a painful burden alone is incredibly isolating. Meanwhile, his father, who has protected the boy from potentially hearing any bad news from the doctor, is now unable to understand why his son would be distressed the beginnings of a profound miscommunication. The father heads outside with his dog to hunt quail. The landscape is coated with frozen sleet and he falls twice while crossing a frozen creek. He targets a covey of quail and kills two before they scatter. Because of the icy conditions, he misses five more, but he manages to hit another two. Rather than being disappointed, he feels happy to have found a covey so close to home and to have so many birds left to hunt in the future. The father can't help his son recover from the flu any faster, so he turns to hunting to pass the time while the fever runs its course. An ironic choice as he occupies himself with killing while his son believes he is dying. Hunting is another conventionally male pursuit and it fulfills the purpose of providing for his family. The father's apparent satisfaction in upholding his masculine fatherly role illustrates his ingrained paternalism that blinds him to his son's growing maturity. When the father returns to the house, he hears that the boy hasn't allowed anyone to come into his room, insisting that no one else must catch his fever. The father goes in anyway and sees the boy looking just as he had left him, pale, feverish, and stubbornly awake. The father takes his son's temperature again, and the boy asks what it says. It's 102.4, but the father says it's only about 100 degrees. The boy responds that the doctor said it was 102, and his father tells him the temperature is nothing to worry about. The boy admits that he can't help thinking about it, and his father tells him to stop thinking and take it easy. 
The boy says that he is, but his father observes that he was evidently holding tight to himself about something. Since the boy thinks he's dying, his self-imposed isolation is an attempt to protect his family from his supposedly fatal fever and tragic death, imitating the protective and masculine behaviors that his father models. Nonetheless, by denying his family the chance to stay with him during his last moments, the boy disregards their will. His father continues to show the same disregard for the boy's right to the truth as he downplays the fever and fails to explain the diagnosis. The father gives the boy the next dose of medicine, and the boy asks if it will do any good. Of course it will, his father says, and starts to read aloud again until he realizes the boy still isn't following along. The boy then asks what time he's going to die, and his father reassures him that he isn't going to die. The boy replies that he heard the doctor say his temperature was 102 degrees. His father assures him that people don't die of 102 degree fevers, but the boy insists that he learned from his classmates in France that a fever over 44 degrees is fatal. The father realizes that his poor son has spent the whole day waiting to die. Here the father finally understands the boy's strange expression and behavior, and the gravity of the father's and son's miscommunication becomes clear. In trying to comfort the boy and downplay this illness, the father only exacerbated the boy's anxiety. The boy's confusion about different temperature scales shows how even the most objective facts, like measurable body temperature, can be misinterpreted with terrible consequences in the absence of clear communication and trust. The father explains to the boy, poor old shots, that the two countries use different thermometers and measurements of temperature, just like they use different measurements of distance, miles versus kilometers. He explains, on that thermometer, 37 is normal. On this kind, it's 98. The boy asks if the father is certain and then merely says, oh, but he visibly relaxes. The next day, the boy has loosened his hold over himself so considerably that he cried very easily at things that were of no importance. The two different systems of measurement for the same phenomenon, like Fahrenheit and Celsius for temperature or miles and kilometers for distance, illustrate the radically different ways in which two people can interpret the same situation. It's significant that the boy cried over things that were of no importance the following day. This behavior, which contrasts sharply with his self-imposed isolation and stoicism, suggests that he's let go of his attempts to appear mature and masculine like his father and can instead relax into being a child again. Okay, so that's our first story in this series. Uh, I invite you now to, to join into a conversation in the comments below, anything about the story at all. And to announce that our second episode for next week is a 1907 short story by O. Henry called The Last Leaf. So I'll be back with you on Wednesday for the discussion of the O. Henry story. See you later, everybody.